welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you and praise you, God, for what you've already done in this place. God, it's so good to come in and celebrate Jesus. Shout your fame and your goodness in this place. And God, we would ask that as we approach your word and open it up, God, that you would open it up to us. Open us up to receive it, Father. Pray that you give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. And Lord God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. We bless them today. We pray that your spirit be among them as you would be among us this day. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Get your Bible out and go with me to the book of Hebrews. We're going to continue our study in the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter number four. Last week, Pastor Jim preached a great message on why Christians fail. It was part number two, and we read through verse number seven. If you remember, he was talking about not hardening your hearts, keeping your heart in in a place with God where you can be soft and pliable and open to the things of God to move at his will. And we continue to study in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. We're going to read verse number eight, and we're just going to read one verse. You know, the word of God is not fast food. This is not some greasy thing that you're going to get out of a drive through window in 30 seconds or less where it's free. This is good food. This is like a, a fine steak that you buy at a, at a nice restaurant. You're not going to just gobble it down. No, that's going to give you a stomach ache. You're, you're going to take your time. You're going to take a little bite at a time. You're going to rub it around in your mashed potatoes and gravy. Come on, somebody. And you're going to get everything that you can out of that meal. And the Word of God is no different today. We're approaching the Word in Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to read verse number 8. It says, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now, you remember we were talking about how the children of Israel, the, the first generation that came out of Egypt, they could not enter into the promised land because of disobedience, because of unbelief, because of the hardness of their hearts. But we do know that the story continues on, and after that generation had died and their bodies fell in the wilderness, now here comes Joshua and the next generation. They come into the promised land. They they fight the battles. They obtain the promise, and, and Joshua divides the inheritance to the people, and the Bible tells us that they had rest on all sides from their enemies. And yet, the author of Hebrews examines that, and he takes a look at that, And he says, let's read it again. For if Joshua had given them rest, if that was the real rest of God, then he asks a question next. Why? Why would he go on to say something else? He says, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now notice there's a capital H in the word he, speaking of Jesus Christ, the spirit of Christ prophesying through David, talking about another day. See, David was in the promised land. David was a part of the people who had inherited the blessing. Here he was living in the promised land, and yet he prophesied that there was another day of rest coming. Spirit of Christ is speaking and saying something to us. And we need to take note. We need to understand that even though Joshua was a great man, even though Joshua had brought the children of Israel into the promised land, even though miracles, signs, and wonders had taken place like the Jordan River heaping up at one point and they all walk across the dry land. They march around Jericho seven times and on the seventh time they give a shout and the walls come down. That is a miraculous victory over their enemies. God drove nations out in front of them. And yet, even though Joshua was this great man, if Joshua had given them rest, then then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. In other words, it's saying that even though Joshua was great, that Jesus is greater. Title of today's message is that Jesus is greater. You know, sometimes you, you come across sermons and all you can remember is the title. Today, if this is all that you get out of this sermon, if this is the only thing that you remember walking out of this place, that's all you need. All you need to know is that Jesus is greater. I like those little two-word sermons. You know those little two-word sermons? How about this one? In Him. You remember that little two-word sermon? That's a great sermon. Sometimes you get depressed, you get down, you get discouraged, but all you need to know is that that's not me. I am in him. In him I have value. In him I have purpose. In him I have all that I need. I am sufficient in him. I am accepted in him. I am loved in him. I have life in him. How about this one? How about this one? This is a great little two-word sermon, but God. Oh, that's a good one. I like that one. All circumstances are telling me this, but God. Not enough money, but God. Kids are doing their own thing, but God. World is trying to get me down. People are talking crazy, but God. See, oh, that's a great little... How about the three-word sermons? Three-word sermons. Here's a, here's a good one. God is able. Yeah. 
Remember that one? God is able. I, I can't do it. I, I, I don't have enough. I, I can't get there on my own. But listen, God is able. Oh, I should be having a better amen than that, but I, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take what I can get today. Today, three little words. Jesus is greater. That's all you get today. That's all you need. As you walk out of this place and you look at your home, you look at your family, you look at the world around you, just realize and remember, recognize that Jesus is greater. See, the tendency in our hearts sometimes is to, to elevate others, elevate people. You, you, that's why the book of Hebrews was written. You remember in, in Hebrews chapter 1, starting out in the very first couple of verses, it says that in times past, God had spoken to our fathers through the prophets. And here the people were looking at the prophets. They said, well, God was speaking through the prophets. The prophets are great. These are, these are wonderful people. They carried the word of God. They showed us the way of God. And, and, and they're saying that these, these prophets were, were great. But listen, Jesus is greater goes on to talk about the angels. And even though the angels have power and they have a uh, delegated authority of God to go and do God's will, even though they are these great beings, listen, Jesus is greater. He makes the argument, to which of the angels did he ever say, today you are my son, I have begotten you? None of the angels heard that. Jesus heard that. Jesus is greater than the angels. Well, the people had lifted up Moses. But in, in Hebrews chapter number 3 and chapter number 4, he starts to talk about, well, wait a second. If Moses was great, Moses brought the children out of bondage, yes. Moses delivered the law, yes. But just as the builder of the house is greater than the house, so Jesus is greater than Moses. And now we come to verse 8, and it says, if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. See, Jesus is greater than than Joshua. Even though Joshua delivered the people, even though Joshua brought them into the land, Jesus still is greater than Joshua. He is above all. And we've got to get a hold of that truth in our life that Jesus is greater. Today we're going to take a look at a couple of things that Jesus is greater in. We're going to compare and contrast the life of Joshua with what the reality of Jesus is in the New Testament and find out that Jesus is greater. Now, let me stop right here and teach you something, okay? And now, I know when I say I'm going to teach you something, some of you guys start to shut down, shut off, turn off. And, and so this is not a time to sleep. Listen, I'm, I'm going to teach you something that as we go through and start to learn and start to experience what it is that God has for us today, that if you get a hold of this truth, when you walk out of these doors, it's not just going to be, oh, hmm, I learned something. And then you never do anything with it. No, you will be able to apply what you have learned to every situation in your life. You're going to be able to take hold of this truth today, walk out of these doors, and when life hits you in the face, you're going to be able to handle it. Why? Because Jesus is greater. Now, here's what I want to teach you today. In the Old Testament, we find that there's something called types and shadows. Maybe you've heard that term. Maybe you have not heard that term. Let me explain to you what, it, what it's talking about. Sometimes we wonder, why, why did God keep the Old Testament? Do, why do we need that? I mean, don't we live in the New Testament? Isn't this where we're living today? You know, isn't that just a bunch of old stories, uh, uh, his, history and some poems and things like that? And sometimes people discredit the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, it's speaking of Jesus. Even Jesus told the, the people, you, you search the scriptures that speak of me. So all of the Old Testament has types or road signs pointing to Jesus. Also shadows, you know what a shadow is, right? The light hits something and then coming off of that substance comes a shadow. Now think about it this way, if you were at the park and you were having a picnic, you had your whole family and you had the big blanket out in the basket and you guys were eating your sandwiches and all that kind of stuff, having fun, having a good time, and you're just playing there at the park on the grass and you looked up or down the way, and you, you saw that there was a shadow of an airplane. You heard the noise of the airplane, you saw the shadow of the airplane, and it was coming right at you. Would you run in terror? I thought I heard a yes. No, no, you would not. Let me, let me answer the question for you. You would not, okay? So let me ask it again, and this time you can answer. It's okay to talk to me today, all right? You didn't come to church to spectate because I'm not cool enough or a good enough preacher to do that. Listen, you got to participate today. So if you were sitting at the park, you had your picnic there, you heard the roar of a plane's engine, you looked up and you saw a shadow of an airplane coming at you, would you run in terror? No, you would not. Why? Because the shadow's not going to do anything to you. It's not going to hit you. It's just an image of the substance, the plane up in the air. Now, let's say a helicopter flew overhead, right? And it came, and the helicopter just kind of hovered right next to you. Would you go jump on that shadow and hope that the helicopter was going to take you somewhere? <laughs> no, you're laughing. Why? Because it can't do any. It can't take you anywhere. Only the substance can take you somewhere. 
As we look at the life of Joshua, we find out that Joshua is the shadow of Jesus who is the substance. Joshua may have taken the children of Israel into the promised land, but he could not take them where they needed to go. Jesus is the substance. He is the reality. He is the the one. He is the vehicle, if you will, that can take us where we need to go. Are you getting a hold of this today? (laughs) Praise God. So today... Jesus is greater in a couple of areas. We're going to take a look at them together. Jesus is greater in, number one, Jesus is greater in truth. Jesus is greater in truth. Turn with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. As you turn with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 13, let me let let you know, we're going to kind of ping pong Old to New Testament back and forth a little bit. So if you want to keep your finger wherever we turn, just know that we're going to be going back there. Uh, sometime eventually throughout the message. Numbers chapter number 13. We've read Numbers 14 and 15 talking about the spies that went into land. Ten came back with an evil report. Two came back with the report of the Lord that they can do it. But before that, we find out that they were naming the leaders of the tribes that were going in, the spies that were going to go in and spy out the land. Numbers chapter 13. We'll take a look at verse number 16. Numbers 13, verse 16 said this. It says, these are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. Now look at the next sentence. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Now, some of your translations may say Oshia without the H. Some of your translations say Hoshea. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Hoshea was the name of this young man who was one of the spies that went out to spy out the land. And Moses saw this young man, and he changed his name. Changed his name from Hoshea or Oshia to Joshua. Now you say, why is that important? Is God just, you know, trying to take account of everything that happened so that when we look in the lineage, we know that this guy Joshua was actually Oshia or Hoshea? You know, what, what is that all about? Well, let me tell you something. God is into names. If you look throughout the Bible, you will find that God uses names to speak purpose, to speak destiny, to speak direction into people's lives. Take, for instance, Abram. Abram was meaning father, right? And so anytime somebody called Abram his name, they were speaking father. But God had a bigger plan for Abram's life. God didn't want him just to be the father of one or the father of two. No, he brought Abram out and said, look towards the heaven. You're gonna, your children are going to outnumber the stars in the sky. And so he couldn't just call him father. He had to call him father of many or father of nations. So he took a piece of his name, the age of his name, and he gave it to Abraham now. And he changed the meaning of his name to speak destiny, to to speak purpose into his life. So here's Joshua, right? But his name is Oshia or Hoshia. What does that mean? Well, that means salvation. Now, God knew the purpose and the call that was on Joshua's life. God knew that Joshua was going to be the successor of Moses. He was going to be the one that would actually take the people into the promised land. He knew that this... Hoshea was going to be the one who would go and who would lead the army of the Lord into victorious battles. He knew that this one would be the one that would divide up the inheritance to the children of Israel. He knew that this guy was going to do some great things in his life. But just calling him salvation might give him the wrong impression. Because if you were to call somebody salvation, they might start to think, well, I did this. I led the people. I I won the victories. I won the battles. I divided up the inheritance. And yet God will not share his glory with another. God is the one who deserves and receives all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. So what takes place, Moses looks at this young man and he says, no, we got, we got to change the perspective of truth in his life. He is not salvation. The Lord is salvation. So he takes the J from Jehovah and he makes his name Joshua now. And now every time he speaks to this young man, he says, the Lord is salvation. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is salvation. Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty is salvation. And he gives him a proper perspective of truth. In his life. Now, remember, we're talking about Jesus and that Jesus is greater in truth. Now, sometimes people have a, have a wacky understanding of what truth is all about. Truth is not what you say, truth is not what I say, truth is not what the social systems say or the economy or, or the education systems. That's not truth. Sometimes people say, well, that's truth for you, but that's not truth for me. Listen, that is a bunch of hooey. Can we, can we talk today? Can we tell it like it is? There is no thing called truth that if it's acceptable for one person but it's not acceptable for another, well, that truth doesn't apply to me or it doesn't apply. No, truth is truth regardless of who it applies to. Truth is truth no matter what happens. There may be experiences 
that only apply to certain people. There may be a, 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 a thought pattern or, or a perspective that only applies to people. But truth, regardless of who you apply it to, where you apply it at, is truth. So that means that truth is not what you say. Truth is not what I say. Truth is what God says. And we, like Joshua, have to get a proper truth perspective in our life. We have to understand that it's not about how I feel. It's not about what I think. It's not about my perspective or my experience. No, this is about us lining up our lives, our experience, our perspective with the Word of God and declaring that God's Word is truth in our lives. Are you listening? Keep your finger there in numbers. We'll go back to the Old Testament in a bit. But turn with me to the book of John. Chapter number 14. John, Gospel of John, chapter number 14. A very familiar verse. In fact, we quote the scripture just about every church service here at The Rock. John chapter 14, verse number 6. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and they're asking him questions and they're dialoguing back and forth. One of them says, Lord, where are you going? How can we know the way? Jesus responds to him in verse number 6. John, the 14th chapter, says this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, by implication of where the commas are placed in this verse, we could also say it like this. We could say Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Me. In other words, there may be some facts in your life. Fact is, you don't have enough. Fact is, you don't feel good. Fact is, that people have turned their backs on you, who you trusted. Fact is, is that you had put all your eggs in one basket, and now the basket burned up. Fact is, is that, 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 that you thought that you had done everything that you could do with your kids, and they still went south. See, those are all facts in your life. But you have to take those facts, and you have to decide what's truth. Is truth what I think? Is truth what I feel? Is truth my experience? Or is truth what God says? And you got to take those facts, and you got to take them to the person of truth. His name is Jesus, and you got to say, okay, Jesus, what do you say about my finances? What do you say about my marriage? What do you say about my kids? What do you say about my health? It will change the perspective of life. See, the fact may be that, that you're not feeling good in your body, but the truth is, by his stripes, you were healed. If you were healed, then you are healed. And therefore, it's just a matter of time when you declare the promise of God that your body will line up with the word of God. Yeah. Fact may be that there's not enough, but the truth is that my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Take your finances and bring them to the person of truth, and he will give you the plan. He will give you the provision. Fact may be that the kids have gone south. But the truth is, is that you can declare over them that I have raised them up in the ways of the Lord and they shall not depart from them even when they grow old. And though they may wander from their borders, they shall return safely. See, the facts may be saying one thing, but the truth of God says another thing. We must believe the report of the Lord. We must line our life up and bring it to the person of truth. His name is Jesus. And Jesus is greater. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus is greater, number one in truth. Number two, second thing for today, Jesus is greater in truth. Quality, greater in quality. You might be saying, well, what do you mean by that? Well, Joshua had some character. I mean, think about this great man who had the character that God would choose him out of all of the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that were a part of the nation of Israel. God could have chose anybody, but he decided to choose this young man, Joshua, and there was a character trait. There was a heart after God. There was something that got the attention of God, that God would take a look at this man, Joshua, and he would say, you're going to be the one to succeed Moses. You're going to be the one that I have chosen to lead my people into the promised land. What was it in Joshua's life that caught the attention of God? You there? And John bounced back to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus. Maybe you kept your finger in numbers. Turn back to the book of Exodus. Second book of the Bible, Exodus, we're going to go to chapter number 33. Exodus chapter number 33. Moses had a tent that he called the tent of meeting. It was also called a tabernacle, all right? And, and Moses, anytime he would see the cloud, God, God had put a cloud over the nation of Israel that led them by day, and it was a pillar of fire by night. And anytime that cloud would descend to the tent of meeting, this tabernacle, Moses would come and he would meet up with the Lord. All the, all the nation would see the cloud descend and they would stand in the doorway of their tents and they would worship the Lord. 
So here is Moses. He's going to meet with God. And take a look at it in Exodus chapter number 33, verse number 11. Exodus chapter 33, verse number 11 says this. It says, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. That's pretty amazing. As a man speaks to his friend. Now take a look at this. And he, speaking of Moses, would return to the camp. So Moses would go and, and he would meet up with the Lord. He would get the vision of God, the direction of God, the wisdom of God. He would take before God his frustrations. Take before God the concerns of the people. Take before God the weighty matters of what was taking place in their nation at that time. And God would speak to him face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And so here's Moses meeting up with God, and then he had to go and take the direction and the vision and the wisdom of God and go implement it with the people or with the situations that he was facing. Okay? Now, let's read the rest of the verse. And he would return to the camp, but his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. What is that saying? That's saying... And I almost get the picture of this young man, Joshua. He's Moses' servant, right? So here's Moses. Here's everybody standing at attention, worshiping the Lord. Here's Joshua watching as Moses goes in to meet with God. And I can almost see Joshua leaning in and, and, and maybe eavesdropping a little bit just to hear what God is speaking to Moses, just to find out what is God saying to Moses, what, what, what's going on. I, I know what took place in, in the camp, and now how's God going to tell Moses to deal with it? What's going to happen? What, what is it that's on God's heart? What's the vision of God? What's the plan of God? And there he is, and, and he feels the presence of God, and he's there worshiping the Lord, and then Moses leaves, and Joshua says, I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to stay close to this place. Why? Because this is a good place. This is where God meets up with man. This is where God gives us direction. This is where God gives us vision. I just want to be close to the heart of God. That was the character that God saw in Joshua, that God knew that he could take this young man and use him to lead the nation of Israel because he had a relationship with God where he would not depart from the Lord. Now we go to the New Testament, find out how Jesus is greater. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. You guys still with me today? You got a little quiet, so I'm, I got a bit concerned. John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter number 1, very familiar verse. John chapter 1, starting in verse number 1, take a look at it with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so we find out this is like the genesis of the New Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because he spoke. The, the word of God was with God, but we also find out in John chapter 1 that the word of God was God. God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The, the Father made the plan. He spoke the word of God. Jesus now carries out the plan. The Holy Spirit creates. The Holy Spirit is the one hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit, the one guiding and, and, and finishing the work. So, so we see God in three persons, just like man, is three parts, but one man, right? You've got body, soul, and spirit. We understand that. We've got a mind. We've got a will. We've got an emotions, right? We've got a body. And all these together is the man. In the same way, the word was with God, and the word was God. Drop down to verse number 14, if you will. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we know that this is Jesus. Why? Because the word became flesh. God in the flesh. That is our Jesus. That is our king. The one who came from heaven, disrobed himself of his glory and put on an earth suit of flesh. Came and lived and stayed and dwelt among us. This same Jesus who, who said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here we read the same thing. The only begotten of the father full of grace and truth. What are we talking about here? Well, I want to Direct your attention to a little word up in the overheads. I've, I've highlighted it there. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Everybody say dwell. dwell. Oh, come on. Everybody say dwell. dwell. All right. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you were to look up that word, dwelt, in the original language and translate it literally into our English language, the verse would read like this. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. In other words, Jesus... The word of God came and dwelt in an earth tent in his time here on the planet. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And Jesus is greater than Joshua. Why? Because Joshua stayed near the tent, but that tent points us to Jesus. 
And so we need to be as wise as Joshua and learn the lesson that no matter what happens in life, no matter how much oppression, opposition, circumstances, trials, temptations, and tribulations, don't let it get you off of Jesus. Don't let it separate you from Jesus. Don't let it back you off of Jesus. A lot of times I hear people say, Pastor, I just feel so, so far from God. I just feel, you know, when I first got saved, it was like fireworks. It was like, you know, just, just this craziness, just this awesomeness. And, and now I feel so far from God. Listen, don't back off of your Jesus. Why? Because he is the tabernacle. He's the one that you can get close to. He's the one that you can get the vision. He's the one that you can get the direction. He's the one that you can get the wisdom for your life. He is greater in quality because even though Joshua was a great man, did great things, Jesus is greater. We need to stay close to the heart of our God. Press in in prayer. Press in in your times in the Bible. Press in in praise. Press in in worship. Press in and keep coming to church. Listen, doesn't matter what you did Saturday night, if you were a screw up, a mess up, if you were foolish, whatever. Listen, that's the time to run to the house of God. Run. Repent. Stop doing that junk. Get off of that and get on to Jesus. And listen, we will love you through the process. You can come in, but listen, not going to stay that way. We're here to change. We're here to get close to the heart of God because Jesus is greater in quality. A couple things Jesus is greater in. Number one is in truth. Number two is in quality. Final thing for today, Jesus is greater in accomplishment. Jesus is greater in in accomplishment. Now, Joshua had done some great things in his life. We know that he led the people into the promised land. We know that he divided up the inheritance. I mean, who else in the Bible does it record that when they were in the middle of a battle and they realized the sun was going down, commanded the sun, sun, stand still. And the sun stood still while they continued to fight throughout the time of night in broad daylight. No one else did the Bible record that. This is a great man who had many great accomplishments. But listen, nothing we do here on the earth has any significance, any purpose, any meaning if it is done outside of the will and the way of God. Oh, I should have had a way bigger amen on that one. All of our striving, all of our collecting, all of our building, all of our work, all of our effort, the Bible says that we are to labor to enter into His rest. What does that mean? That means get out of what you're doing here on earth. Stop striving to build kingdoms on the earth. Stop striving to build wealth on the earth. Stop striving to build your life, your fame, your thing. And it's time to get into the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. All the things that are here on earth are temporary. They're going to be burned up. I don't care how big or small your house is how nice your car is, how many degrees you got on the wall. None of that matters except to men here on the earth. But those things that are highly esteemed in men's eyes, God doesn't even look at those things. What is eternal is the word of God and the relationships that we build here on the earth to get people into heaven. That is what matters. That is what is eternal. And so we've got to stop building castles in the sand that the waves are going to knock over. It's time to build for eternity. It's time to get a hold of people and compel them into heaven, bring them into the house of God, take hold of them and say, listen, hell is real, but heaven is also real, and let's take you there. Time to start declaring the word of God, the eternal word of God. All flesh is like grass and the flower fails, but listen, the word of the Lord stands forever. Jesus is greater in accomplishment. You're there in the book of John chapter 1. Turn with me to John chapter number 19. John chapter number 19. Jesus has fulfilled everything that was written about him in the word of God. Listen, Jesus knew the word because he is the word. So Jesus knew that he needed to be born in Nazareth. I'm sorry, in Bethlehem. He knew that he needed to go down to Egypt and be called out. He knew that he needed to go to Nazareth and live there. Jesus knew that he had to do miracles, signs, and wonders. He had to heal people. Why? Because he had to fulfill the prophecies about him that he himself bore our iniquities and bore our sickness, and by his stripes we were healed. He knew that he had to go and be delivered over to the religious leaders of the day. He knew that he had to be handed over to the Romans who were in power at that time, and he had to be mistreated and hung on a cross. He knew that he had to be lifted up on a tree. Why? Because cursed is everybody who hangs on a tree. He became our curse so that we could be blessed. See, Jesus knew the scriptures, and here we are in John chapter number 19, 
And if you read, I won't put this up on the overhead, but if you have your Bibles, verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. He knew that there was one more thing he had to do. Psalm chapter number 69 said that his tongue was dry and his mouth was parched, and therefore he had to fulfill the scripture. He said, I thirst. Drop down to verse number 30. We'll put this up on the overhead. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. In other words, everything that he had to do here on the earth, he accomplished. He finished the work. He had done everything that he needed to do. Now, the story doesn't stop there. Take a look in the book of Hebrews. You know where Hebrews is? Turn there. Hebrews chapter number 10 this time. Hebrews chapter 10. Stay with me. Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to take a look at verse number 11 and verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 11 says this, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Now stop right there and look up at me for a moment. Every priest stands. Notice that they're standing. Everybody say stands. You guys got to keep up with me. Everybody say stands. Every priest stands ministering daily. Everybody say daily. Offering repeatedly. Everybody say repeatedly. The same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Thank God he didn't just leave us there in that verse. But there's a verse number 12 that comes afterwards. But this man, speaking of our Jesus, speaking of our King, this man, capital M, Jesus Christ, the righteous, the one who had finished his work here on the earth, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Now, maybe you don't know what that means, but every priest on the Day of Atonement went into the Holy of Holies, and he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. But no priest had ever said, okay, God, finished my work for today. Let's hang out. Never happened. If he did that, he would fall over dead on the spot because the work was not finished. There were more sins coming. There was another Day of Atonement coming, and the work was never finished. But Jesus Christ goes to the cross, gives up his spirit, Leads captives in his train. He goes to the heavenly holy of holies, into the presence of Almighty God, not on earth, but in heaven itself. Sprinkles his blood on the mercy seat, making atonement, taking away sin forever. And then after he had finished the work, he sits down at the right hand of God, signifying that we can now rest in his accomplishment. It's finished. It's finished. You say, Pastor, that's great, but but how does that apply to my situation? I still have needs. Well, listen, it's already paid for. Jesus paid it all. Jesus took care of it. Now it's time to get yourself lined up with his truth. Get yourself brought into the character and don't get off of Jesus. And believe God for the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Your provision is finished. It's taken care of. God's already got it under control. Your kids, your, your relationship with your husband or wife, it's finished. It's already taken care of. The word of God has you. The word of God holds you. The word of God, you got to put it into your life. Get that truth. Get yourself lined up. You got to get it, get that character. Don't get off of God. Don't let it get you off and rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. If your body is still hurting, you're still in need of healing. Don't get off of Jesus. Keep proclaiming the truth of God over your life and let the word of God finish the work in you. You can rest in Jesus. Joshua may have started the work, but Jesus finished his work. Jesus is greater, number one, in truth, number two, in quality, number three, in accomplishment. Turn back with me to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Let's read it once again with new eyes today. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse number eight. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. That day is today, my friends. We can rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you got something from the Lord today, come on, give him a great big praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God is good to us. I want to talk to some of you guys before we leave. You guys were great today, worshiping and praising the Lord. We had a great time. You guys were were great receiving the word. I really believe you got something. Thank you for letting me minister that to you today. God is so good to us that we get to do that. But listen, let's not just stop there. I want to speak to some of you guys. I want to just take a moment of your time. Nobody get up. No one leave during this time. Don't check your phone. Turn it off. Make sure that there's no distractions. Lock in because God wants to speak to you. It'd be a tragedy if we had such a great time in the house of God today and you walked out of this place, your heart wasn't right with God, you died and went to hell. I don't want that to happen. 
You don't want that to happen. And let me tell you something else. God does not want that to happen. So let's talk. I don't think anybody here wants to go to hell. No one's excited about that. Some people deny the existence of hell, but listen, Jesus talked about it in the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. And just because you deny its existence doesn't make it any less real. It's like saying, I don't believe in Mack trucks. You go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway, you're going to meet one face to face sooner or later. So come on, listen up. Let's talk. Hell is a very real place, but heaven is also a very real place. And I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to go to heaven. But a lot of people are confused about how they get there. Here's my question to you. How are you going to get to heaven? Just answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Sometimes people say, well, I've been good. You know, I've been a really good person my whole life. I've done a lot of good things. I used to be bad, changed my behavior. Now I'm good. Helped people out, gave money to charities. And I've been really good, and God lets good people into heaven. The problem with that statement is nowhere do I find in the Bible that God lets good people into heaven. Like God's some jolly old Saint Nick in the heavenlies making a list and checking it twice of who's been naughty and who's been nice. It doesn't work like that. You're not going to get to heaven by being good because the standard is perfection. And there's only one who is perfect. His name is Jesus. Not going to make it by good works. Sometimes people say, but I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Took me to religious classes like Sabbath school or Sunday school or catechism class. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck and had you baptized or christened as a child. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Every born in America goes to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that your parents raise you in church, tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you go to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible say America is the Christian nation, and if you're born here, you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get there. And I love you enough today to tell you the truth. And again, nowhere do we see in the Bible that it says that because you aren't some other religion that by default God looks at your life and lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven and denying hell come on let's talk today what makes you think you're going to go to heaven sometimes people say well not only when I was a child did I go to church here I'm sitting in church right now I'm sitting in front of you right here pastor that's great I'm glad you're here today but could you show that to me in the Bible where church attendance gets you to heaven not there nowhere in the Bible to say sit in church service call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian it doesn't work like that any more than you can sit in your garage call yourself a car that makes you a car can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Some of you might be thinking, well, wait a second. I got involved in my last church. I helped out. I sang in the choir. I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to a church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible because you were church involvement gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Some of you might be thinking, well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I understand all that, but I, I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas every year of my life. Sing the songs. I, I could even quote scriptures to you from the Old and the New Testament. I know God. Doesn't that make me a Christian? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you read your Bible? The Bible says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scripture, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And you get to go to heaven because of it. Rather, this is about your heart. It's always been about your heart. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is after your heart. Jesus said it like this, you must be born again, John the third chapter. Now, I know our society and a lot of other people have made a lot of statements about being born again. This is not about what society or those people say. This is about the truth of God's word. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Here's what it means. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. If you haven't done that, then I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. You must be born again. That's what Jesus said. You must be born again. This is all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Got to give him all of your heart and all of your life. Let me prove it to you. Revelation, the third chapter. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to you guys here in church today, speaking to us. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm. What's that? Well, here's what it is. A little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected 
and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to go just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hands. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, whoa, wait, time out. You're going to point and count at me? If I raise my hand like that in front of all these people, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. But get over that embarrassment. Why do I say that? Because it's better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. No one would make that trade. Come on, today you can give God all of your heart and all of your life in this safe and friendly place. Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So come on, today, your call, your choice. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job, sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. He finished the work. Now, it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart and will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or you're online, wherever you're at all over the world, get ready to get your hand up. God sees you, and then you can tell an usher, come into the church service right afterwards, or if you're online, click the button, respond to God, and Pastor Jim will show up and lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. I'm gonna count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go, all together on the count of three. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else over here? Seven wise people already. Eight. Thank you. Anybody else real quick up on top? Wave it at me. Nine, 10, 11. Thank you. I got all you guys. 11. Anybody in this section? 12. Thank you. 13. Up on top, where you at? 14, 15. Thank you. God bless you guys. You can put your hands down. 15 wise people. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see your hand? 15, 16. Got you in the back. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Where you at? Number 17. Sitting there wondering if you should. I got you guys up top. Thank you. God bless you guys. 17 wise people already. Where are you at, number 17? You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. You should. Come on, go for it. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? They're pointing back there. Is it in the family room or is it up top? Up top, wave it at me real quick. I got you, got you. Number 17. Where are you at, number 18? 18, thank you. God bless you right there. 18, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? You know you need to give God all your heart. No, you need to give God all of your life. Up there, thank you, gotcha. Number 19, 20, come on. Where are you at, number 20? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Come on, number 20, we're waiting for you. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 19 wise people. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, real quick, all 19 of you, or if you're number 20, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. You still haven't missed out. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout as we do. Once you get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. You just get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend. You come right now. Just come on. Come on. Let's welcome them as they come. You come. Lord, I give you my heart. Come on, no one leaves during this time. Let I them come. You, you just come right soul. now. I live for Let's give the Lord a great big praise. They're coming. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You come. Come on. Every moment I'm away. Lord, They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. From the family rooms, you can bring your kids. It's okay. Come on down. They're still coming from the foyer. Come on, come on, come on. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Anybody else, if you need to come, just come on down while I'm talking. Hey, everybody up front, take a look up here for a second. Do this. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? You came to give God all of your heart, and you came to give God all of your life. Now, let me introduce you to a friend of mine right over here to my right. This is Pastor Dave in the red shirt. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder if they're weird. All right, this is about as weird as it gets right here, okay? Over here is cool, all right? Pastor Dave's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are. He's going to take you right over there and pray with you, give you some free stuff. 
and then introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll describe how it works. It's all free, and you need to do it, okay? So make a left turn, if you will, and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go.